Welcome everyone to this, the next session in the Republican Labour Education Forum's educational series. The topic this evening is Republicanism and cartoons. And so we are absolutely delighted to have Martin Rosen to speak to us. He's a leading satirical cartoonist, also a journalist and an author. Phil Velland is going to introduce Martin, so let's go over to Phil. Everybody and a big welcome to Martin and all of you, of course, but delighted, I must say, uh, to have Martin here. It's been, uh, it was a, a little chat at the, at the Chartist dinner that I came up with this thought that maybe we might, you might like to come and address us on something to do with republicanism. And he very kindly said yes. Um, quick mention for uh, a brief biography, uh, a few details. Uh, Martin's been drawing for uh, 30 years at The Guardian and um, at Chartist magazine, he's been doing the covers for Chartist for the last 39 years, unbelievably, it's true. Uh, that's, he's coming up to his fourth decade being completed and Martin draws the cover for Chartist um, for, uh, as a sort of contribution to the magazine, which gave him, a, I think it's true to say, Martin, uh, a, a job which you were very kindly uh, felt you ought to repay by drawing the cover for then for eternity, mm. as far as I can tell. They um, used to pay me. They used to pay me, then they stopped. So, yeah. Yes, uh, I find that that's probably preferable to my situation where they never started. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I would like to just briefly mention a couple of things that Martin's uh, doing at the moment or has done. Uh, a dead cat bouncing on your table is Martin's current, I'm right, I think I'm right in saying, publication with Peter York. It's about the culture wars. And coming out later this autumn is As I Please, which is a collection of Martin's uh, written journalism, plus a rewrite of Pope's, Alexander Pope's The Dunciad, which um, Martin and I both share as a sort of favourite poem in the English language. I'm lucky enough to have a preview of that. Don't know if you can see it on my awful camera. It's very messy. But anyway, oops, there it is. I'll show it to you at some point. Martin kindly signed it anyway. That's what I was trying to point out. And I'm delighted to say that it's going to be published as a proper publication later in the year. So without further ado, I'd like to pass, a, pass over to, uh, to Martin. And if you want to go into the chat room and put a clap together, then please do. We, I'll, I'll mute myself now. Okay, well, thanks very much, Phil, and uh, thank you everyone for asking me. And um, what I'm going to be talking about this evening uh, is um, not so much the role cartoonists have played in a Republican movement, but the way they have responded to the main beef of the Republican movement, which is the existence of the monarchy. And I wanted to start with the first slide, which is by the great... James Gilray. We can get that one up. Here we go. And um, Gilray, after Hogarth, who was described as the grandfather of the political cartoon, James Gilray really cemented the cartoon in its current form. He sort of created it out of a, a kind of amorphous sense of this is what we do we have we have uh, we have these, these these satirical prints this is part of the game and he made them a major art form uh by doing images like this which if you look carefully you can see is actually a very patriotic portrayal of his majesty king george the third who literally embodies the nation uh, because there is his head up in Durham, in County Durham, and he is repelling the French invasion fleet, if you look carefully, by, and there's going to be a lot of foul language in this talk, so you better gird your loins now or go elsewhere, uh, by shitting on it out of his arsehole in Portsmouth. Now, if you've been to Portsmouth recently, you'll realise this could be a photograph. Uh, and it is a absolutely typical Gilray image because it's funny, it's scatological, it's filthy. And in this case, it's actually deeply patriotic. It is, it is a monarchical cartoon because there is George III embodying the nation. Uh, the fact that this was published at all 
is worthy of note and it needs a little bit of explanation. And so I'm going to give you a brief history lesson um, to explain why something like the next image, please, Steve, uh, by an anonymous printmaker in 1720 was possible at all. Uh, it's an image of the first prime minister, Robert Walpole, prime minister being one of those interesting words like Tory and Christian, which was first coined as an insult. And he was called prime minister because he was gathering all the offices of state to himself so he could milk them dry. He was also known as old corruption. And here you can see somebody trying to get into the corridors of power by kissing the prime ministerial arse. Uh, and Gilray was working at the end of the 18th century. This is the beginning of the 18th century. And in many ways, the 18th century is not only the age of enlightenment, but also the age of satire, where you have an open sewer of satire running through the age of reason uh, as a consequence of historical forces, <clears throat> which have been building up uh, for over 50 years. Next slide, please. You will, of course, recognize this as Charles I, uh, having been beheaded. This is from a book I did with a man called Andrew Jimson, um, my Tory friend, Andrew Jimson, who has done several books. First, first started off with Jimson's Kings and Queens, and we've done Prime Ministers, and we've done American Presidents, and we're just about to do Great British Heroes. And um, <clears throat> as ever, I find one of the best people to collaborate with somebody with whom I completely disagree about everything, but that's how you get a nice connected, creative dialectic going. Anyway, um, as we all know, Charles I was such a bad king that he was beheaded. Um, next slide, please. We then, very briefly, from January 1649 to, I think, 1653, had the English Republic, and I'm waiting for it to be revived until it was more or less terminated by Oliver Cromwell under the Protectorate. <clears throat> uh, but the when Cromwell died, the issues which had given rise to the English Civil War, the execution of the king, the Commonwealth, and which had also led to the deaths of 10% of the population of these islands, premature deaths, uh, still had not been resolved. Uh, next slide, please. And then came the disastrous reign of James II, who sought to create an alliance with the nonconformists against the Anglican Tories, he wanted, because he wanted tolerance for Catholics. And there were all these different forces. There were the grand old cause, uh, Republicans. There were the high church Anglicans. There were the low church Anglicans. There were the Catholics in there somewhere who weren't really getting a look in. There were the nonconformists who formed the backbone of the Republican armies during the Civil War. Um, and James II was not the man to reconcile these problems. And following a nosebleed which lasted for four days. He vacated the throne uh, at the same time as his nephew and son-in-law, which was of course the same person, uh, landed in the last invasion, of successful invasion of Britain in Tor Bay on the 5th of November, 1688. Next slide, please. 5th of November being an iconic date in British history, not just uh, Guy Fawkes Night, but also the invasion of William of Orange, also Tristram Shandy's birthday, curiously enough. Uh, and this was the great Whig Revolution. This was the Whig Revolution where they defeated the Tories, um, who were high church Anglicans. They set up a, a basically a coup d'etat of Whig landowners. But at the same time, because they did this through Parliament, started the process which has led to the kind of parliamentary democracy we sort of still enjoy. And as a consequence of this, there was one of the most beautiful moments in world history, in my opinion, which has also been completely forgotten. And one of the reasons it's so beautiful is that it was an accident. And it happened in 1695. And it was when they were meant to be renewing the Royal Licensing Act in Parliament. Well, the Royal Licensing Act was essentially state censorship of the press, uh, which was which had such draconian punishments that it had to be renewed. It's like the Prevention of Terrorism Act. It used to be renewed every two years. And the same thing happened, needed to happen with the Royal Licensing Act, because under the provisions of the Royal Licensing Act, you could be hanged, drawn and quartered for writing rude things about the monarch. 
If you wrote slightly less rude things, you could be sentenced to having your ears sheared off with a pair of clippers by the public hangman uh, on the scaffold. And the Puritan print, uh, printmaker and pamphleteer and preacher John Prynne was actually sentenced to have his ears sheared off twice to the confusion of the, ex the public hangman when he pulled back his hair and realised he had no ears. Anyway, um, the Royal Licensing Act, Licensing Act was not renewed in 1695. It seems because somebody, either deliberately or otherwise, forgot to put it in the parliamentary timetable in order to renew it, and therefore it lapsed. And suddenly, because you were no longer likely to have your guts pulled out while you were still alive for writing rude things about the king or his government, there was this mushrooming of free expression and of satire. And they spent 20 years trying to work out how to get this, book, uh, this, this draconian law back on the statute book and then realised that actually people rather like this. So they decided they would tax free expression rather than penalising it. And they brought in the Stamp Act and the, with the death of Grub Street, where these scandalous things were being produced all the time. Next slide, please. Uh, which led directly to the toleration of visual satire, which had been around for since the invention of printing, uh, but had been subject to draconian laws unless you were under the protection of a powerful man. But what happened now was, again, a beautiful moment. People started attacking power for its own sake. And this is what I do. This is what I have been, I'm in a tradition which goes back 330 years. And we have been part of the British political establishment for that time, the foul-mouthed, dirty-minded, childish, puerile part of the British establishment. But nonetheless, we are part of that political conversation. And there is no other country on earth which has had a freedom of political expression through visual satire for the length of time we have. And it's something we should be very proud of. Um, as a consequence, it meant that 80 years on from this, sorry, 60 years on from this, next slide, please. The young James Gilray can produce an image like this. I thought I knew every Gilray engraving until etching until I discovered this in a print shop in London a couple of summers ago. And it's uh, the Marks of Rockingham. And it's the only image I'm aware of depicting a serving prime minister, both vomiting and defecating simultaneously to make an arcane point about a now forgotten news story about public expenditure. And it actually typifies the English sense of humour. There's something so earthy and puerile and rude and hilarious about it that we should have this on the banknotes. We really should. This is, gets to the very heart of if Britishness means anything, this is what it means. Um, however, although this kind of material was tolerated and indeed it was encouraged by the subjects of the satires who saw it very much as a, a mark of their metal. If you can't take the jokes, then actually you're probably not up to the business of governance. And one of Gilray's biggest fans was Charles James Fox, the Whig leader, who he would regularly portray as a drunken, morbidly obese traitor and yet would go to Mrs. Humphrey's print shops where Gilray sold his prints and buy them by the dozen. Um, however, occasionally there were problems. So the next slide, please. This print, uh, which was produced in 16, sorry, 1795. And if we could have the next one, we just have it in color. Because uh, when we look at these 18th century artifacts, now we mostly see them in color, but we shouldn't forget that the original artist wouldn't have coloured them. These were coloured by anonymous women um, in order to charge more money for the prints. You know, they got paid very badly. But uh, when talking about the provenance of art, we can talk about the great artists, but let's also remember the people who make them last into history by making them look so beautiful. There on the right is the Prince Regent, as he then was, the Prince of Wales, the future George IV, and his infant daughter, Princess Charlotte, who is being presented to the Whig leadership. There's Charles James Fox, the unshaven fat fool, and behind him is Sheridan. And Gilray would probably have got away with this had he not subtitled it The Wise Men's Offering. Uh, this is 1795. This is when Tory repression 
is beginning to kick in against Republican clubs when for even selling a copy of Paine's The Rights of Man, you could be transported to Australia for 10 years. Had he not called it the wise men's offering, he probably wouldn't have been arrested and charged with criminal blasphemy by a maverick Tory Christ evangelical Christian magistrate in Covent Garden. Now, the way Gilray got off this charge is another story. Uh, it involved George Canning, the future prime minister, who then basically got Gilray to produce stuff for the anti-Jacobin. Gilray's politics are a a mystery to this day. Uh, essentially, he was a businessman making money, uh, exploiting the market, which was for visual satire. Um, so it wasn't the attack on the Prince of Wales. It was the blasphemy. It wasn't the Les Majestés. It was the blasphemy, which, which got the attention of the authorities. Uh, however, soon thereafter, the authorities extended their intolerance towards criticism of the kings. The next slide, please. And this is by uh, Robert Newton, who is a great loss to British caricature, died at the age of 21. He really was a wunderkind. He'd been producing stuff since he was 15. And there's this magnificent image of John Bull farting in the face of George III. You'll see there is a scatological thread going through this talk, as there indeed there is going through this kind of work. Um, and there's Pitt on the left-hand side of the image saying, that's treason, Johnny. Uh, well, it got to the point where wiser cartoonists stopped showing the king at all. They were just, he was just shown by suggestion. Um, but while uh, Pitt was then being careful after this new climate of intolerance came in, you just look at some of his previous work and you can see that Underneath it all, he understood that there was something inherently hilarious about associating the monarch with bodily functions, whether it's an image of the king shitting on the French or just an image of the king shitting. So the next slide, please. And there is absolutely no reason whatsoever why he should have depicted George the third and his consort at stool as they are being told by Pitt the Younger about the assassination of the King of Denmark, beyond the fact that it's just funny seeing the King have a shit. And here we actually get to the very heart of what satire is about. Now, Ian Hislop said years ago that satire is about puncturing pomposity. And for my money, that's one of the most pompous phrases in the English language. It's not about that. It's like in the words, the wonderful old joke, about the woman whose son goes for his first job and he comes home in tears because the foreman has been really horrible to him, has been bullying him. And, you know, and the mother with the wisdom of mothers says, well, come on, if he's so smart, how come he shits and he's going to die? And these people who place themselves in the current structures of society in a position of authority and power over us, who want us to treat them like gods, essentially, because they hold power and they hold wealth. It's our political response to that by laughing at them, by reminding them that they shit and they will die, by tearing aside the raiments of power, the robes of office, and showing the pissing, sweating, shitting person underneath. Uh, nonetheless, Gilray, after about 1796, was playing things carefully. After he got into the hands of Canning, next slide please, he uh, said, I think I'm going to start attacking the Whigs. The Tories have more money. And uh, here is another oh, nuanced and careful Gilray of George III, again embodying the nation, looking at a tiny Lilliputian uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. At the same time as he was doing this kind of stuff, Gilray was also producing images of William Pitt the Younger as a, as a toadstool or an excrescence growing out of a dunghill and the dunghill actually being the British monarchy. But again, did he sell, did he produce that because he knew it would sell to the radicals? Or did he actually believe that himself? Um, as I said, his politics is a great mystery. And I have read many learned tomes by people who assume he, is, he was a radical 
because at a dinner of satirical printmakers in a tavern in the 1790s, um, he proposed a toast to David, the great French radical uh, artist. And people assumed that this was because he supported the French Revolution. I think it was probably a joke. But to try and get academics to understand that cartoonists might actually tell jokes is an almost impossible task in my real, in my experience. Anyway, next slide, please. I pastiched this image uh, with this one when they tried to uh, get Ofcom to control the likes of Zuckerberg. Anyway, next slide, please, Steve. Yeah, and uh, this is a this is another famous image by Gilray of George the Third. Uh, it's called a frugal. It's called Temperance or a frugal breakfast, and it shows Farmer George sitting there eating his breakfast egg with some greens, which his consort is eating because she's German and therefore she's just going to eat cabbage all the time. And it was produced to be uh, an example of how the king would eat a frugal meal because you know he was representing the nation. Um, now I pastiche this. I'm going to show you quite a few pastiches of Gilray. Next slide, please. When the story broke about uh, 10 years ago that Prince Charles, as he then was before he became King Prince Charles, was constantly deluging government ministers with letters. And here he is saying, uh, having a breakfast, is, you know, take yet another letter to Her Majesty's government, and as usual, we'll leave it to them to dot the I's, cross the T's, and lick my R's. Uh, and 20 years before that, Go to the next cartoon, please. The next slide. I did this cartoon ch channeling the spirit of Gilray and the falling standards. Oh, footman, uh, look up how to spell meddling, irrelevant, hypocritical, and anachronism by the time Mrs. Parker Bowles leaves, will you? And the footman is saying, Thank God, at last a return to the traditional methods of George the Fourth. And the next slide, please. And here he is, George the Fourth, again from the Gibson book. And next slide, please. And one of the reasons Gilray did this image of George III, next slide, please, was to point up the comparison with his son, a voluptuary under the horrors of digestion. Uh, you probably can't see it clearly, but please look this up if you're not familiar with the image. It is a wonderful example of the powers of visual satire, of the genius of this kind of dark voodoo, where you just put in all these symbols and you get uh, a message, a clear political message coming through, which uh, is done with practically no words at all. There are physics in there for the treating of syphilis. There are sort of indications of a kind of cannibal feast. And there he is, a big fat fool. Um, Gilray wasn't alone in canarding the Prince of Wales or indeed the Prince Regent as he became. And the next slide, please. As you can see from this fantastic cartoon by George Cruikshank, who was very much the heir to Gilray. Gilray collapsed into um, kind of mental incompetence in the end of the 1800s um, as a result of alcoholism and general despair and moodiness. And there was a kind of apostolic succession where the young Cruikshank, who was had been doing cartoons because his father was a cartoonist uh, from his early teens, he was presented with Gilray's drawing table and introduced to Gilray. And Gilray said, you are not Cruikshank, you are Addison. I am not Gilray, I am Rembrandt. Sorry, Raphael which is a you know a rather sad tale but he certainly took up the spirit of Gilray in this wonderful thing the prince of wales or the fisherman at anchor and and kept at it and produced next next slide please produced a series of pamphlets with the radical printmaker william hone who was subject to three notorious trials in 1816 for republishing John Wilkes's uh, blasphemous catechism. It was the minister's catechism and it was deemed to be blasphemous, it was deemed to be seditious, and they tried Hone, who had printed it, hadn't written it, but he printed it, um, on three successive days in the Guildhall uh, in an attempt by the state to crush him. And what he did is he made 
the jury laugh. Uh, several books about it, including a play by the aforementioned Ian Hisloff and Nick Newman called The Triumph of Laughter, how Hone was acquitted because he got the jury on his side by making them laugh, and the sort of wonderful redemptive power of laughter to take on the threat of tyranny. But with Hone, Crookshank illustrated the house that Jack built and also more successfully, but well, this is a massive success. The next, the next slide, please. Um, which was the Queen's matrimonial ladder when Caroline of Brunswick, who George IV had married, but uh, was drunk when they got married and claimed the marriage had no meaning. And when he became king, there was that wonderful scene during the coronation when a mob led on by Lord Broom, the Whig peer, in support of Caroline of Brunswick, tried to break into the King's coronation in Westminster Abbey to, to crown Caroline of Brunswick, uh, including trying to batter down the doors of Westminster Abbey with a battering ram. Now, wouldn't the coronation of our own dear King have been so much more exciting if that had been going on outside? Anyway, in the matrimonial ladder, next slide, please. You can see the various terrible things that the King is going through. Um, consternation, recrimination, exaltation, and uh, qualifications and all this kind of thing. And they're just trying to deal with deal with Caroline of Brunswick, which of course he succeeded in doing in the end. So he got rid of her. And um, next slide, please. And here's a, a lovely drawing by Crookshank of the dissolute George IV in a state of complete collapse. And this really was the high holiday, but also the the end of this period of satire, of visual satire, in its relationship to the monarchy. Now, one of the curious things about Cruikshank is that he succeeded in his portrayals of William IV as both Prince of Wales and Prince Regent, and indeed as King, in getting paid three times. The point about these images is they weren't published in magazines or books, they were published as individual artifacts as prints. And they'd be sold in print shops, up and down the streets of central London, there'd be these kiosks that would be selling these prints and you could borrow them overnight. You know, you can see from the wax stains on them, people would peer over them with a candle, looking at the details and then take them back the next day like a DVD or when DVDs were still being borrowed from DVD shops. Um, and what Crookshank would do, would he would run off a series of prints defaming the Prince of Wales, who would then send his agents out to buy it uh, buy up the entire stock, which they do, and then he'd just run off some more and he'd sell those and the agents would try to buy those up as well. And he ended up actually being paid a pension by George IV, not to draw him at all, and he did it anyway. So he got paid three times. Um, this was something I suggested to Keir Starmer the only time I met him uh, when he became the MP in succession to Frank Dobson for the constituency where the Cartoon Museum used to be. And uh, he turned up to one of our exhibitions and I welcomed him as a trustee of the Cartoon Museum and told him this story and said, you know, if you never want me to draw you, Keir, I'm sure we can come to an arrangement. He looked at me with blank incomprehension and we never saw him again, but there you go. Um, but uh, this was pretty much it. The satire then died away. We moved into more deferential times. There were certainly a few cartoons attacking William IV during the Great Reform Bill, but nothing of the same quality or vehemence as we'd seen under the young Crookshank and under Gilray. Um, and it became deferential. I cannot find a single published British cartoon which is treating Queen Victoria in the same way. Although Queen Victoria had a role in saving many of these images because as a consequence of George IV sending out his agents to buy up all the stuff he didn't like, the Royal Collection had a huge body of late 18th and early 19th century satirical prints, and it still does. Um, some of them were sold off in 1920 during a sterling crisis, during a moment of austerity, when they sold off about a quarter of this collection, and half of it went to the Library of Congress, and the other half went to the Marx Engels Institute in Moscow. Um, but there's a lot of it remaining. The Queen's Gallery, or no, now the King's Gallery, I presume, around the back of Buckingham Palace, puts on exhibitions of uh, quite a lot of 
pornography by Rowlandson, but also these truly brutal cartoons about the uh, the grandfather and uncle of Queen Victoria, who, when she acceded to the throne, acquired this collection. And I gave a talk at the Queen's Gallery. I gave a couple of talks. They're nice people. They're always very welcome to my, quite open in my hostility to their patrons, but um, they have no problem at this point. And uh, I was told by the curator what had happened, that the largest contribution to this collection, this unique collection of 18th and 19th century satirical prints, is because of Victoria, because she inherited this collection of prints from her uncles. And she was by instinct a collector. She didn't understand them. She didn't really look at them, but she realized it was a collection and therefore she sent her agents out to go and buy as many of these things as were left because it was a collection and should therefore be complete. So we must thank her for that. Um, here's a picture of her, next slide please, produced in a French magazine. Um, the most vicious, this is for her Diamond Jubilee. Uh, the French have got a long tradition of canarding, nice French word, our royal family. Next slide, please. This is by the aforementioned David, the painter of the death of Marat uh, and the coronation of Napoleon. Uh, that, in case you're wondering, is the British establishment. You can tell that by its black leathery wings and its crown. And it is, uh, and you, if you look carefully, you can see its buttocks on the face of George III, and he's shitting bayonets on the paw. Uh, next one, please. And a hundred years later, this is a French cartoon of Willie, of um, Edward VII with Britannia lifting up her skirts. This was at the time of the uh, Entente Cordiale. Showing that the, the French have no problem at all with that. Um, again, a scatological image, as indeed is this one. <coughs> Next one, please. Uh, which is the only image which is really rude I can find of William IV. But this was long before he was William IV. This is when he was uh, the, was he, was he the Duke of Kent? I think he was the Duke of Kent. And he was having an affair with Mrs. Jordan, the actress. The Jordan was a nickname for a bedpan or, or chamber pot. And here he is, a lover's hole. And he's going into the cracked Jordan, so you can see what that's all about. This is from the 1790s. And of course, William IV and Mrs. Jordan are the great, 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 great grandparents of David Cameron. Moving forward, there's very little to find. Next slide, please in terms of satire about our royal family from us. This is a very tedious image of George V, produced during the First World War. There was lots of nasty German stuff about George V, but this is the kind of stuff that the British were publishing. And this is my drawing of George V from the Jimson book. Next one, please which seems to be more on the money, as far as I can tell. Uh, and here's his useless son. That's the first one, the one who would have uh, gladly have become a kind of puppet king under Hitler. And the uh, next slide, please. And here's the one we got instead. Uh, but almost impossible to find any cartoons of George VI uh, beyond simple, straightforward portrayals of him as the symbol of the nation. Uh, and this sense of deference continued. And I'm not saying that there were no brutal cartoons about the monarchy, but they weren't being published. They weren't being published in the mainstream press. And the most aggressive political cartoon about the royal family or about the monarchy didn't appear until the coronation in 1953. Next slide, please. In, I'm delighted to say, the Manchester Guardian. Um, next slide, please. And here it is by the great David Lowe, subsequently Sir David Lowe, uh, for my money, probably the best political cartoonist of the 20th century, who uh, had a price on his head. The Gestapo would have had him shot on sight had they invaded Britain in 1940. In fact, there was a Gestapo death list of about 25 British cartoonists who were just going to be summarily executed, including, weirdly, Heath Robinson, who did political cartoons for Punch at the time. And this is the morning after. £100 million spree. There's reality in a very primitive old tea 
TV sort of reminding people what the monarchy costs and the shit rain that descended on low after this. There was something to behold, an absolute storm of indignation, a fury, hardly anybody supporting him at all. Um, and it remained thus for many years to come until in the 60s and the 70s, and the dream started to fall to pieces. And I started working for The Guardian in 1986 um, on the personal finance pages. Then I moved to The Weekend Guardian. Then I started doing political cartoons for them in 1994. And this was one of the first ones I did. So the next one, please. Um, sorry, this is from a, a book because I lost the original of this, but this is 1994. When the, they, they made a trip to Russia, um, the Queen made a trip to Russia. So this is a, a reenaction, a reenactment of the execution of the Tsar and his family in a cellar in Tsaritsyn, I think it was. Um, if history repeated itself, and one of the finance was saying, forget it, boys, let's save on ammunition and leave it to them. Because however much deference there is in the media, and they're very deferential when they think they're going to get a peerage out of it, even they couldn't disguise that the dysfunctionality going through the House of Windsor was of the type probably unseen since the House of Atreus uh, in the Aura style. Uh, next one, please. I mean, I had been trying to put the boot in from an early age. This was a cartoon I did for a magazine I produced when I was a student at the time of the Royal Wedding in 1981. Um, exclusive pictures, there he is standing on a box Corgi snipping around. I got a lot of grief for this from my contemporaries, from people in their 20s and late teens saying, oh, it's so disrespectful. You can just see in the background, I said, is she pure? Um, another cartoon I did at the time for another magazine. Next one, please. After the birth of Prince William, this is that royal baby, the recessive gene of Hanover, shock horror. And uh, you can see there's sort of a crocodile in there somewhere, the old reptile trope. And the next one, this was uh, this appeared in the same student paper and uh, almost got the printers to refuse to print the magazine anymore. Uh, whoops, another palace intruder. Strange that, Mom, you don't taste like you do on the stamps. Very childish, deplorably bad taste. But, you know, why not? Uh, next one, please. And by the 1990s, I was working for Time Out, who would let me do more or less anything. There's a whole series of cartoons I was doing about the breakup of the Wales's marriage. Um, Next one, please. Here she is, the death of the old year, latest pictures when Diana would be visiting the dying. Next one, please. The uh, Princess of Wales needn't kid herself that her suicidal feelings about the state of her marriage or anything new, you know. Ignore it, it's just a cry for help. Next one, please. Here they are, meanwhile, the newly opened grounds of Buckingham Palace. I think your mother's taking this Windsor fundraising bit a bit far. I'll chuck over, over you for only 500 quid a throw. Next one, please. It's pretty straightforward where I'm coming from. And in the long term, not really a problem. His and hers. Tumbrils for the guillotine. Next one, please. And here the guillotine has wrought its dreadful work. Uh... And I just want to share the pain with all those other people who have suffered the pain of being beheaded on the order of a revolutionary tribunal of ordinary poor people who just want to be shown that someone just loves them and understands their pain and so on forever. And the next one, please. And uh, this one, we all live in troubled time, steady team. Remember, we're the bulwarks of the nation. Christ, they're not showing too, are they? So there's Prince Andrew up to it 35 years ago, for God's sake. Um, and the next one, please. And there's Di uh, so much for fairy tales. This is Fergie turning back into a pumpkin. And the next one, please. And this is the only one I ever got into real trouble for. And uh, it was two weeks after the secret of her bulimia is revealed to the world, the Princess of Wales resumes her hectic public schedule. Of course, the worst part was persuading her to eat a champagne bottle for lunch. As you can see, she's throwing up over the powers of the ship. I would not do this cartoon now. This is a nasty, vicious, unpleasant cartoon. And the response from the letters pages of Time Out the following week um, was indicative of the fact that I'd probably gone a bit too far. 
Uh, people say, I have loved and cared for a bulimic for many years and Martin Rosen should be publicly castrated. Read one of them. Uh, another one wanted me to have my house burnt and my, my pets killed. So, as usual, when people are offended by a cartoon, they then threaten to kill you. I um, mean, I've had death threats throughout my career. Uh, I don't take them seriously unless somebody sends one of my children's ears through the post to my home address. But um, people get very upset about things. Anyway, a lot of people complained about it. The following week, uh, I was gratified that they published a letter saying, Dear Sir, I'm a bulimic. I thought Martin Rosen's cartoon was very funny, and I pinned it to my fridge. Anyway, next one, please. <laughs> and uh, this one was when Diana was revealed that she was visiting the dying in hospital secretly. And, uh, you know, it seemed a bit... She was a, she was a, a, a troubled and confused woman um, who had been treated extraordinarily badly by some really rather awful people. But uh, this seemed to be going a bit far. And this is now in the collection of the British Museum. And the next one, please. And uh, then, of course, she died in tragic and horrible circumstances, uh, mostly because she had just become a plaything of the tabloid press. Uh, having been appallingly treated by one part of the British establishment, she was then appallingly treated by another part of the British establishment. My uh, colleague, Mike White on The Guardian, sort of once described her as like a, uh, a princess chained to a rock as bait for a dragon, which I think sums up the poor woman's life and fate rather well. Um, but the death of Diana was, a, was an interesting moment. I remember having lunch with... Uh, a lefty journalist friend of mine who could not understand it was beyond her comprehension why all these people emoting in the streets this public you know this national outpouring of grief why they didn't turn into a revolutionary mob and I tried to explain it to her that you know actually that's not what they're about they're not against the royal family they're against those parts of the royal family who have treated Diana who they could relate to for some reason um I could lost on me but um what they wanted to do, rather than being told to go shopping, which is what their political leaders have told them to do for the previous 25 years, they wanted to express their emotions. They wanted to emote. They wanted to be magnificently sad, which they were. Um, however, it was a moment. Next one, please. I did this cartoon uh, for The Guardian on the day of her funeral. And it looked for a moment as if it might all go. I mean, I did think watching that funeral that uh, children really should be taken into care um, as they were being dressed in tweed, that, you know, they were going to spend the rest of their lives just sewn into tweed and lead terrible lives. Um, and we know that one of them actually thought that. Next one, please. And then, of course, there was the there was the problem of how do you deal with this? Are you allowed to actually even talk about this? People were talking about the death of Diana as if it was um, the equivalent of those terrible moments in history where we will never laugh again that it was one of the most terrible things that had ever happened, which of course it wasn't. It was very sad, but it wasn't the most terrible thing ever. So this is the cartoon I did for Time Out after a couple of weeks. I don't know about you, but I'm getting sick of the taste of, of sick of eating flowers. Next one after that. Uh, and this was when they were going to open the memorial gardens and the, the landmines. It's to stop the dogs shitting on the flower beds. It's what she would have wanted. And the next one, please. And this is what I did on the 10th anniversary of her death. Um, just because I thought, why not? Let's, let's just have a bit of a laugh. Hell, Terry, it's been 10 years. When are we going to tell Jug Ears we faked the whole thing? Patience, my child, patience. Because, of course, she died at the same time as Mother of Teresa of Calcutta and George Schulte uh, and Geoffrey Bernard. They all went together in the same few days. It's really quite odd. Um, next one, please. All this time I'm working for the mainstream media. This is a cartoon I did for the Independent magazine in 1992 of the Queen Mother, uh, where they compelled me to, air, to um, not airbrush, but to tip X out her colostomy bag, which was at the bottom of her dress. That's pretty standard. Next one, please. Uh, I was delighted for Red Pepper, which is a bit left field as well as left wing. I managed to get away with this one for the marriage of uh, William and uh, what's her face? You're only falling for this shit because you're being fucked by the Tories again. And the next one, please. And uh, 
this was cartoonated for the Guardian, which was uh, slightly less on point, but you'll see that the tongues of the broadcast journalists, including Hugh, Will, uh, Hugh, what's his name? God, I've forgotten his name. <laughs> He's a national scandal, and I forgot what his name is. Um, woven together into a kind of red carpet, high above the horrors of actually living in Tory, Lib Dem, coalition, Britain, under austerity. Uh, next one, please. And this was from 10 years earlier when the butler published his book saying, uh, don't even ask. That's it. You only came forward now because you knew he was going to expose your secret plot to kidnap Posh Spice. Don't be idiotic, Charles. It's because he knows that Angus Dayton is rightful king. So what I was doing is I was taking an old trope about how they're in fact a reptilian fear beast from the planet Zog. Next one, please. Which I repeated again 20 years later in 2020. Uh, never let the light in. Harry, dear, I'm just telling the creature. Harry, dear, do come and dine and explain to us again precisely what the problem is she's having with the family. You can see they've made a bit of a mess of the woodwork and the carpet with their great reptilian talons. And uh, the next one. And this was for the New European in a review of Harry's book, where you can see that actually this, this is a family, as I said, the most dysfunctional family since the Oresteia. Um, since the House of Atreus. And the next one, please. Caught in an eternal kind of Ouroboros, where they're just devouring each other. So Harry's devouring Wills. Wills is devouring, is, is licking his father's feet. His father is devouring the patriotic red-faced gammons who are devouring the press, who are devouring Harry, and round and round it goes. And uh, the next one, please. And uh, then... then um, the Queen was killed by this trust. I mean, with its extraordinary dispatch. Hardly took her any time at all. Um, and I was at a meeting at the Cartoon Museum, which I was sort of trustee at the time, when the news came through that the Queen had died and uh, the Duke of Edinburgh was our patron. And our chair was saying, you know, I just heard the Queen has died. And he was spent the meeting writing a letter of condolence to um, Prince Charles and writing a press release about you know the connection between the family between the royal family and the cartoon museum was strong and great which is an interesting thing it obviously goes down the generations back to back to uh, george the fourth um but so i was there with steve bell and we were and i i had to do a cartoon the next day and i said oh god i've got to do a bloody cartoon about this how do i do a cartoon about this this is this is terrible and we were just trying to think of the most inappropriate cartoon you could do which would never be published anywhere and the one we came up with would be the Queen on top of a funeral pyre with the government throwing corgis onto the pyre, um, which we enjoyed for our own private amusement. What I came up with was this. Next one, please. Which I think is not in time. I mean, I, 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 I could hold my head up having done this. It made a point. It, I think it made an important point that there is a galleon upriver time like an ever rolling stream and there is Charles in a rubber dinghy with Liz Truss in, a, in the meltwater and you know it was of significance once why are we doing this why are we getting there I think the Republican sentiments are quite clear in that cartoon and indeed they are in this one as well next one please which um, was after the funeral which Luckily, the week before, between the death and the funeral, I was actually at an academic conference in California, so I was spared it. But I got home in time to see them bringing the coffin out of the abbey and say what you like about the British establishment. They can march in step when they want to. So hooray for that. And here is Charles looking rather sad, or King Prince Charles, as I think we really should call him, while they take away all the showbiz stuff, all the props, and the Tory party conference is coming on. And the rest of the news agenda is coming on. Um, but I also did this one for Flying Leaps, my anarchist poster maker friends, um, who uh, have a, a splendid tradition of putting up posters, of fly posting around the place. Uh, and next one, please. And that's where that was on Coronation Day, um, scattered around the place. Nobody really noticed. I don't think anybody really cared about the coronation. It was raining again, you know, rained at the last coronation, rained at this coronation. 
tells you something about something. Um, however, we had a party that year, and every year we'd like to have a theme to our party. So we had a coronation party uh, in the August. Next one, please. And I made this made this little tableau. You can make your own coronation anytime you like. Um, if you look carefully, you can see in his right hand, uh, Prince Charles or Prince King Charles is um, holding a fur cup. My cartoons are always littered with these fur cups. It's an homage to Merritt Oppenheim, the surrealist sculptress uh, who produced objet, which is a cup and saucer made out of fur. And a fur cup, because it's an homage to a surrealist objet, it is pronounced with a thick French right. accent, so it's a fur cup. <laughs> and um, so it's a fuck up, basically. So he's holding a fuck up. And there they are. And the crowns had bold sweets in them. And uh, we finish on this one. We finish on this, the next one, please, which is uh, the Duke of Edinburgh, who, uh, very briefly, I know I'm running a bit over time, um, as I said, was the patron of the Cartoon Museum. As a consequence, I met him several times, and he would always fix me with a gimlet eye. And There was one occasion when we had a fundraising dinner at St. James's Palace, and there were three cartoonists in the room. Myself, Peter Brooks of the Times, and Nick Garland of the Telegraph. And Garland was too grand to meet the royal family, it's far too high class. So Brooks and I were summoned into the ducal presence. And he said to me, So, is your work ever syndicated? And I said, I actually have absolutely no idea. And he turned to Peter Brooks, and I need to stand up for this bit. So if I can just get a shot. And Brooks went, Peter Brooks, sir, the Times, like that. At which point Phil the Greek said, The Times, bloody self righteous Murdoch rag, I wouldn't have it in the bloody house. And I said, But the Guardian's the self righteous one. He said, No, it's not as bad as the bloody Times, and turned on his heel and stalked off, leaving poor Peter sort of standing there like that. And uh, it was a story I repeated on Twitter after Philip died. It was taken up by various people. And uh, so I gave him an easy ride. I thought, He'd like this. He would laugh at this. There's a bloody big grace. Um, and that's where we are. That's where cartoonists are, where we have a, we give them a kick. We make people laugh. And I hope treat them with the irrelevance they deserve, despite the fact that they are, as my father said to me when I was a very small boy, they are the cock crowing on top of the dung heap, which is the reason why we're Republicans. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Martin. Uh, if you, Steve, if you could stop screen share, that would be good. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. That was hilarious. I had to mute myself because I, I would have been laughing and disturbing the whole meeting. It was very, very, very good. But I have to say, though, I had a very soft spot for Princess Diana, and I was sad when she died i must admit anyway um if anybody would like to ask questions of martin or would like to contribute please put your electronic hands up now and i can bring you in mike i'll bring mike in thanks martin that was that was a wonderful kind of parade through hmm, the best part of 300 years and I just wanted to, I mean, you know, the, the cartoons of the 17th and 18th century were truly savage and they really, they really went for it in a way which was extraordinary. And, and even though the monarch was often at the centre of it, it was, they really pricked the sort of pomposity of uh, a lot of political life and, you know, the coffee house life and all the rest of it. Um, not aware. Well, one question I have: Did any cartoonists satirize the slave owners, for instance, during yeah, your yeah. run-up? Right. Well, you can tell but us. They about also, that. they also, they also satirized the abolitionists. Yeah. Well, so they did. So, so they did on both sides. So, so Gilray, as I said, he was a businessman. So he did cartoons which satirized <laughs> slave owners, and he did cartoons which satirized abolitionists as well because he was just selling stuff and people people would write to him with ideas for cartoons which he'd then do because it was just you know sort of how he made his money but it's interesting i mean the um 
Kenneth Baker, the former Tory Education Secretary, was a trustee of the Cartoon Museum as well, and uh, knows his cartoons. I like Kenneth a lot. And he once told me a, a really fascinating story about how the French ambassador at the Court of St. James in about 1780 sent a dispatch to Versailles saying, this country is on the verge of another revolution. It'll be like it was 140 years ago. They're going to chop off the king's head. There'll be blood running in the streets. It's an act that you just go down any street in London and they're selling these prints of depicting the royal family in the most unspeakable fashion imaginable. It's, um, it, it, it's beyond reason. It's going to be terrible. There's going to be another revolution. And of course, exactly the opposite happened. Because in France, they had no tradition of tolerated visual satire. They had no sort of escape on the pressure cooker. And what they had instead, they had sort of uh, sex libels and Samizdat bile. But there was no element of humour about it. There was no element of laughter, which sometimes makes me feel worried that, you know, we laugh instead of actually taking to the streets. But it did stop the blood running through the gutters. That's one thing in its favour. I just wondered, as a, as a follow-up, sort of move, moving to more recent times, you showed the cartoon of Lowe uh, and the, the the extraordinary, even by the standards of present times, cost of the royal family, mm. for, in, for which he got into a lot of trouble. Did, did the Guardian defend him? And does, don't, before you jump in, does the Guardian defend you and a very final question has anybody been able to um produce a cartoon there will not be much humor in it i'm afraid or very hard to find humor in the whole gaza situation uh well they did defend him he kept his job um the, the, the thing about The Guardian is it's, it's a weird thing, The Guardian, because it actually believes in allowing different opinions to be published in its pages. It may not seem like that when you're reading it, but it does. There's a, there's a world of difference between Ardicha Chakraborty Char and uh, Polly Toynbee, for example. Um, and you'll be familiar with the problems I had last year when I they published a cartoon of mine, which other people deem to be anti-Semitic um, for which I apologise because once it's out there if people interpret it in a way I hadn't seen then I'll apologise because I always say I mean I, I have three golden rules I've always had throughout my career um, I never attack anybody less powerful than me I never attack people for their for what they are but just for what they think and do so I don't attack them for their gender their ethnicity or their sexuality and if I ever offend somebody I haven't targeted, and I haven't targeted Richard Sharp, I will apologize. So I apologized and I sorted it out. And uh, and the paper, I'm still working there. I'm still working there. Um, sometimes you think actually it gets pretty hard it gets quite it gets pretty hard because there are certain things now which people don't want to go anywhere near i've never done a cartoon about the trans debate um in fact i don't don't even make jokes about it a few years ago when i was still active on twitter i just wanted to put underneath my profile i me which i thought was quite a good satirical comment on the trans debate <clears throat> because that's what most people think of. They don't think of them. That's, that's the pronouns they use. It's all about me, it's me, 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 me. And my daughter, who is uh, who's then in her late 20s and is clued up about these things, saying, don't do that. You will be crucified online by everyone. And it's just not worth the bother for a gag. And she was right. Um, it's sad when that point of view becomes the orthodoxy. I'm not going to say this because it's just too much bloody trouble. Um, I have done many cartoons about Gaza. Uh, no jokes, but humour is merely part of the armoury of a political cartoon. But I've done Gaza at least 20 times in The Guardian and elsewhere. Thank you very much, Martin. I've got Tim Oxton. Tim, I'm going to bring you in now. Yeah, OK. Um, 
First of all, thank you very much, Martin. Um, secondly, I'd like to, to say how sad I was when um, Steve Bell was sacked by The Guardian. Uh, yeah, you're, you, you're still in contact uh, with him, I imagine. How is he getting on? Uh, he is, well, I don't, I don't, I mean, it's not my place to talk about Steve's relationship with the Guardian. Um, of course that's, that's him. Uh, I think he, he is sanguine. Um, I think he, I mean, he has said, you know, it was, a the way to tell me to retire. Um, and he's 74 and he probably had enough in a way they had fallen out of each out of love with each other some years ago and he wasn't very happy there and they weren't very happy either um and it was just you know that it was it was all very i i, I don't really want to talk about it more than that because it's not my place to but okay i, I went i went i went to um i went and we, we did a we did a gig about gilray in fact at yale in may so we had a nice trip to the states together and you know, hung out, and we're mates. And I'm very sad that it what happened. Um, thank you very much, Martin. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to bring in Phil Vellander now. Yeah, uh, Martin, thanks so much. Really great talk, really enjoyed it. Um, a few months ago, we had um, Ian Hayward, who I think I mentioned to you who was talking about the the queen the queen and uh, and uh, George the fourth the he locks her out of the uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know of Brunswick but intriguingly two things one they threw stones at the coronation carriage but the other thing they did was that she turned in at least until she was paid off into a republican totem she becomes this sort of marvelous symbol of republicans which is a glorious irony which i yeah. almost think could only happen in this country really <laughs> but um she she morphed from being an object of derision into being a subject of uh, celebration really because she was opposing the horrific um george the fourth uh i had yeah, a... I, mean, it's, it, I mean it's, it's interesting phil that if you, if you look if you look back to when the when the royal family was politicized before they became incredibly anodyne. So we can probably guess their politics, the fact that uh, no Labour former prime ministers were invited to William and Catherine's wedding. I think that's pretty clear what was going on there. But of course, uh, the Prince Regent was a champion of the Whigs to get at his father. Uh, Queen Victoria's mother, the Duchess of Kent, was a champion of the Whigs to get at mm a brother-in-law and uh, you know it it, it, it always it, 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 they, they used to have factions you know the point about political factions and political parties was which royal did you support against whom because the tories were bloody jacobins you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I was going to just say another couple of things and one was that um i'm wondering whether you'll struggle with with this current labor iteration of labor uh anodyne seems an insult to, the, to anna really and um, the entire crop of them are so disgracefully boring. I mean, I'm just appalled that I have to listen to some of their voices for the next five years. Um, but I was thinking more of the lines that one might satirise. I mean, if if they're going back to austerity, I mean, it's a bit awkward, isn't it? I mean, you can run a couple of cartoons on, like uh, Rachel Reeves with her haircut on Osborne or something, but I'm thinking of... Just where are you going to go with this? Because it, it just looks like such an, I mean, the bland leading the bland, isn't it? I mean, well, I, I people say, you know, where do you get the ideas and where are you going? And what, I mean, the thing is, Phil, I never know because it's always dictated by events, by the news. So we'll see what happens tomorrow. Um, I never think, oh, I'm going to do this cartoon next week because events will change. Um, at the moment, I can I can do about six of them. And I have no idea who the others are, but I'll just put this into your heads for you to reflect on. Don't you think that Wes Streeting has got a face like a full Brazilian? <laughs> <laughs> he 
he's very shiny. He's very, very shiny. So I just I'm that. in danger of revisiting Cameron on that one with Steve <laughs> Bell's uh, depiction of Cameron inside a I won't a say French yeah, letter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. I was going to say French letter because of your uh, late night 1790s. I thought I'd go back there. <laughs> Thank you very much, <laughs> very much, Phil and Martin. I'm going to bring in Steve Freeman, and now. Thanks, Martin. It was really interesting and, and very funny. I was I was I was laughing as we went along. It was it was really good. Um, I, I, the story you told us that it, it sort of follows the patterns of history. I mean, you want the Civil War, the Glorious Revolution, the 18th century, George the Fourth, and I'm just wondering what it, it seems to have fought you in the story you've told us. It seems to have fallen off in the eight in the 1840s. So first of all, I'm wondering. What what's going on between the 1840s and because there was a, a a genuine republican movement in the early 1870s, I mean a mass re, mass republican yeah. movement until about 1874, the defeat of the Paris Commune on one hand and Queen Victoria becoming the Empress of India. So I, it makes sense to think that we are going in the, the way you've described it that. Uh, deference and patriotism and all that. So, the, you know, it seems to disappear, this kind of uh, yeah. satire. Yeah. But but, is, but just, yeah, just before, you, before, you, before you come back, it seems to me, if we're thinking of this as the arc of history, maybe we're in a period at the end of the monarchy, you know, I mean, 300, after 300 years, are we going to have another 300 years? Or are we in the end times? In which case, the crisis of the royal family from the 70s, the 80s, right up to now, Maybe it's a time when satire, uh, this kind of satire might come into force again. I don't know whether it might revive if if we're in that situation. So my question was just really about the pattern of history and what that might yeah. tell us. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, of course, the, um, you know, history is written by the people in charge. And so if you're looking, if you're looking at satire, which has a wide circulation, the history of selling satirical or, or the tradition of selling traditional satirical prints in the way they've been sold since the 1730s, 20s or 30s, just disappeared in about 1840. It just died away because of Punch, which was originally a radical paper, but it quickly became seriously reactionary and seriously cosy and bourgeois. And um, I'm sure that there was a very lively and healthy Republican movement. I know there was. Uh, and it wasn't getting any traction in the mass media as it then was constituted. So it's not, I mean, newspapers didn't actually have cartoons in them until 1900. So you wouldn't have seen that reflected in newspaper cartoons. Uh, they might have been in small circulation magazines radical magazines but they they haven't i mean i can't find any i can't find any cartoons british cartoons um attacking the monarchy i mean they may well be there in small pamphlets but not in any archive that i know of i haven't looked comprehensively but you know just because that is the story it doesn't mean it's the story <laughs> it's not the whole story it's their story which we're to we're told we've got to believe you know like we're told to believe we had a glorious empire and we're not allowed to actually dig through the 10 feet of skulls of slaves on which the whole thing was built. You know, um, As to this being the end times for the monarchy, I, I mean, I just find the idea of King Prince Charles so preposterous, so ludicrous. And I'm sure he does as well. I'm sure he actually thinks, you know, why are we doing this? And um, <laughs> I, I, have, I have a fantasy because... You know, part of this, what, what I didn't delve into is because it would take forever, is the completely abusive relationship between the media and the monarchy. Mutually abusive. Um, that You know, they expect money. This is the monarchy. They expect money and deference. Um, the media expects limitless access, gossip, copy. Uh, and it's... Yeah, and also using good good members of the family, bad members of the family. Let's kick Harry because it's a good way of bringing people against this. You know, it's just nonsense. It's all nonsense. 
However, there is a way through, which is as follows, that the King, Prince Charles, King Prince Charles has some major national event. I don't know. He, he developed, he manages to grow a talking carrot at high growth. Who knows? <laughs> and there is a national day of rejoicing and outpouring out yeah. of joy. And he affects a reconciliation with Harry. So they're all of them standing on the balcony. And we know that Buckingham Palace was actually pretty jerry-built. <laughs> and the only people there who aren't there are Prince Andrew and little Prince Archie <laughs> in California. And there is a tragic balcony-related incident. <laughs> And according to the rules of primogeniture, on which the whole fatuous edifice is built, which is worshipped by the tabloids because it's good copy, none of them, the sun and the mirror and the mail and the rest of them, who roll the royals in the shit all the time, they're never going to call for the abolition of the monarchy because it's too good for sales. Suddenly, according to the laws of primogeniture, they will have King Archie I, <laughs> whose regent... <laughs> will be the princess of woke <laughs> princess <laughs> Meghan. and that's Meghan. primogeniture yes and if you believe in the monarchy you cannot oppose that unless you believe in the monarchy so much you're prepared to sponsor a good old-fashioned dynastic civil war like we used to have in the 15th century and i can't see many people turning up to fight in the armies of prince andrew <laughs> this sounds like a future great cartoon, by the way. Write that down. That to, um... <laughs> write that down for a future cartoon. Yeah. Well, I, I used, to, um, used to illustrate Kevin Maguire's column in the Daily Mirror, and he's a fierce Republican, and uh, he was going to write something rude at the, uh, for the coronation. And I suggested he write that column, and he said they won't let me. <laughs> they just won't yeah. let me. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Steve and Martin. I'm going to bring Jennifer in now. Jennifer? Thank you so much for that wonderful antidote to the Labour Party conference today. <laughs> I wasn't watching. I went out to lunch instead. <laughs> no, well, you were very, you were very wise. Um, I wanted to thank you for talking so much about deference because I feel that deference is our downfall. We are never going to have a revolution while the yeah. country defers all the time I know. Uh, and, and it just makes me very very angry and i seem to have been born without deference whereas everybody else has it in i don't know whatever um and just just makes me very angry we we need to drop the deference they're only humans and of course all that scatological stuff is exactly the right thing to do to puncture the deference so yeah. thank you for, for raising that. I don't know how we can change the population's mindset, but we must. Absolutely, Jennifer. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I'm going to bring Mike back in again. Mike? Yeah, thank Jennifer, thanks, because in a way you you led us back to the, to, uh, the events of the present and the Labour Party, because... In a way, I, I disagree with Phil that some of the, the the current characters are so boring. I think you, you Martin, <laughs> have already managed to really kind of pinion, um, or whatever the word is, um, Starmer with his ridiculous hairstyle. I mean, the first time I saw the man, I just thought, that's not, I can't believe this. It's not real. Um, and you've just developed it into this sort of crenellation, and it's great. And and um, also you brought out a malevolence both in him and especially in Rachel Reeves. Now, I, you perhaps haven't seen it, but maybe you have. There was an event at at this uh, the Labour Party conference today where Reeves was speaking, where. A a, Palis, a Palestinian heckler got up and really I've gave us some. You've I've seen, seen it. That. And no, do I've you seen. see the fury on her face? She's really you know, I, I I think it really matches some of the some of the sort of uh you know 
just iron desperation that, that, that shows. And yeah, I mean, streeting, there's something weird about, you know, I never quite got Tony Blair's scary eyes thing. Streeting's eyes, no, they really are scary. They're not quite real. There's something going yeah. on there. He does look very plastic. Although, in yeah. his defence, apparently his grandfather was a bank robber. Yeah, well, he maybe he's maybe he's, he's permanently alarmed because of that. But I mean, <laughs> I think I think I think I think the thing is is that um, you know, I mean, the monarchy as we are not the kind of Republicans, I guess, who who you know, first and foremost, and you know, the front and centre are about removing the monarchy. Of course we want to re remove the monarchy. They're ridiculous, but that's not really the main point of it. Our We want to promote mass and popular democracy, and our enemies are those who suppress it. And there are some very sinister things that go on, are going on, you know, within this same Labour Party. The way that guy was hustled out today looked pretty brutal, actually. Um, but there's a lot else. The, the arrests of significant journalists in the last several weeks, for instance, um, by forces, you know, who the heck were they? They weren't quite police. They weren't quite... Who were they? They didn't sound like anybody. There's some sort of secret state came out and, you know, the forces of the crown. And that does bring us back to our main aim. Well, I, I, and, and I support it wholly. Um, um, I think the, um, you know, people ask me, there are a lot of people who, who assume they know what my politics is. My politics is basically, um, you know, the politics which wields power, the politics which seeks to usurp it, and the politics which seeks to thwart it. And I'm firmly in the third category. That I think we should just anybody who wants to be prime minister, you should attack <laughs> anybody who wants to wield any kind of authority or power over me and take away my autonomy <coughs> should be stopped. Uh, and that includes people who want to um, be richer than me, <laughs> you know, uh, and, uh, you know, and s steal my autonomy that way that, you know, there's, well, this is not the kind of animal we are. It's a completely false lead we've, we, we've, we've pursued we've somehow got diverted from what we should truly be um, but it's also I mean but it's all so preposterous but also the the sight of the the, the Labour Party uh, being like school prefects I've always found utterly nauseating you know oh you can trust us with the school prefects let's all ha let's all sing kumbaya and then everything's fine no actually burn the fucking school down <laughs> Mom, thank you, Mom. Excise that bit. Excise that bit from that. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Not at all. I refuse. <laughs> I'm going to bring Phil in again. Yeah. It, thanks, Martin, for that ex exercise. I like the idea of exercise books and exercise books. Um, yeah. I, I, I think my my thinking on this is that the the Labour Party, as such, is just the management while the Tories are out of power. But basically, we don't want to do anything too difficult. But the point people don't... I mean, I was listening to James O'Brien's show while I was coming back from London, and it really was shocking the way this man, who has made millions, I mean, he's a very wealthy man, and how they broke Britain, and yet he hasn't got the faintest idea about what these people actually... who they work for or what they work for. And our definition of the crown, Martin, is, is that network of power and influence. It's not about institutional uh, things like king, parliament, that stuff. I mean, the fact that people don't know the, the difference between the crown and the and the monarchy is is significant, I think. But when you watch him, then they and they get all caught up with, oh well, you know, you say, well, Starmer's nothing compared to to um, Johnson because he, he Johnson spent on a room what Starmer spent in five years. I mean, this is a kind of journalism that somebody who's supposed to be a radical comes out with, and it's absolute garbage. But the crucial thing I think about Labour is people in this country, within three weeks, his popularity has dropped like a stone. And they're all, you know, they're going on about this business of how, oh, these suits and glasses and tickets for Arsenal are irrelevant. Yes, it's a right wing plot. Yes. But that's what right wing papers do. But what's crucial is nobody's asking why 
they brought in this cut in the uh, pensioners. Who does that please? Who do they do that for? Who did they do the two child allowance, two child cap? How, who did they keep that for? That's that's never connected up with anyone. It's left there floating in the air. And look at just Reeves, as I call her. She has a smile like a rictus. She looks half dead when she smiles. And I think that who are they serving? And the answer is the city, the treasury, and the and the Bank of England. The the, the crown is financed by these things, and then they buy their way into the party, just like the Tories. And then people think they're different. They're not. Labour are managing the, the shop, as you rightly say, until the Tories have grown up enough to let themselves in through the back door. I think um, um, I, I sort of worked it out the other day. It's, it's, it's a nice conspiracy theory, so let, let me run with it briefly. Um, that we know that actually the world is run by the bond markets, uh, which uh, are like a force of nature because they're not susceptible to logic or sense or charity or kindness or rational thought they're just a thing but you have to make a ritual sacrifice to the thing and the tories um don't really have to try too hard to make the ritual sacrifice because they rapidly identified throughout the 14 years they were in power we need to be performatively cruel to a section of society who should we do that to the young they're never going to vote for us anyway. So we'll triple their tuition fees. We'll offer them no hope of the future. We'll call them snowflakes and then we'll conscript the little bastards. And uh, The Guardian actually, I, I, I never actually pitched it to The Guardian, but I, will, I wanted to do a cartoon when Starmer, it's not Starmer, Sunak, same person, was suggesting conscription of him and James Cleverly standing next to a wall in front of a firing squad. One of them saying to the one, maybe it wasn't such a good idea teaching them how to use guns, you know. But the um, and of course they have to do that because they have to prove to the bond markets who like to see a bit of toughness, you know, a firm hand on the tiller. So they have to engage in performative cruelty. So performative cruelty. Well, let's let's take you know, let's make the tough decisions and beat up the weakest person in the room. We won't make the tough decisions about actually closing down the bond markets or taxing the, the hyper rich. We'll take. We'll we'll we've got a choice between that and beating up a crippled child. Okay, Sonny, throw away your crutches and take your medicine. It's always the same, always the same. And, of course, Labour have to go through the same thing. Otherwise, there'll be a run on the pound and, you know, have a sterling crisis, as is the traditional way. And they'll think, well, well we've got to do this, we've got to do this, we've got to do this. Well, you know, let's not do, let's, let's we'll keep the, the two-child limit because we'll just say it's too difficult to do that. And that's a bit difficult. And we'll, we'll just make that a point of loyalty and we can purge McDonald as a consequence. But... Um, but we've got to do something else, otherwise they won't believe us. Else, well, they'll be a run on the pound. What we do? Well, who's not going to vote for us? The old fuck them. <laughs> Let them freeze to death. Fuck them. Who cares? We'll show we're tough. And it's a kind of Peter Mandelson political playbook, which was thirty years out of date thirty years ago, and it's preposterous. And what they should do is quite simply make the tough decisions, which means you take off the entrenched institutionalised power by, for instance, banning hedge funds. Why not? Do what Harold Wilson was going to do, nationalise the city of London. Actually, say to the money people, we're going to tax you at 110% on all of your wealth until you are in grinding poverty, just because it's funny. <laughs> you know, you think you're all powerful. We are the state. We have atom bombs. Fuck you. And we'll never dare do it. It's preposterous. It's utterly preposterous. That sounds like an absolutely marvellous idea. And I really, really, really wish we could do that. That's absolutely <laughs> brilliant. It's like it's, your it's balcony. It's an idea which people find incredibly popular when I suggest it. And of course, it's never going to happen. Isn't that a shame, though? It's like it's like your balcony vision. I mean, I, I can't get over that. I think that's marvellous. <laughs> so I don't see any more hands up uh, at the moment. Um, it was. It's been... Absolutely brilliant, Martin. Um, so entertaining, so relevant as well uh, to what we're talking about, what we're all about in this group. But just absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us. Um, I just pleasure. wanted, just before we say goodbye, I just wanted to uh, advertise our next session, which is all about the Commonwealth. Steve is going to go back to basics and, and talk about our vision for the Commonwealth of England. And I'd also like to just advertise our trade union group, uh, 
uh, because it is now Republican Labour trade union group, and like those people who are interested who are, are very active unionists. Please, please do get Patsy on our WhatsApp group and come up with ideas, et cetera, et cetera, uh, uh, because I'd like the, like the group to just go from strength to strength. So uh, uh, now we've got... I, so sorry, well, we've got the before you time. finish, Carol, before you finish, sorry to interrupt you. Can I just mention Martin's book again, just before we go? Yep. Uh, Dead Cat Bouncing on Your Table with Peter York about the culture wars and then, as I please, coming out later this autumn, a collection of his written journalism plus the rewrite of Alexander Pope's Dunciad, which was somewhat lewd when I read my copy, but I understand it, it, it'll probably be slightly less lewd by the time it hits the, hits the streets. Oh, more, more lewd. Excellent. Uh, just checking. All right. Sorry about that, Carol. Carry on. Yeah, can you, no, uh, Phil and, and Martin, if you can send me those links, I can, when I, when I send out the recording, I can send the links to those books as well so that people have got the links to them. Okay, thanks very much, Phil. So I just want I just want to say thank you very much indeed. It's been a highly entertaining session. Uh, thank you for giving us so much of your time. It's been brilliant. And to the questions as well. The questions have been really good and, and enabled you to come up with some brilliant answers as well. So thank you. Thank you to everybody who's attended and enjoy the rest of your evening. Okay, thanks very much, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.